Hello, everybody. You're all having a good day. So I did a poll on Mastodon yesterday, and there was a lot of interest in just some general OS development. Um, in particular, a lot of people want to learn about how to kind of get started with the graphics and you know, network integration. Uh, but to get there, we're going to have to write a little operating system first. So the plan for today is to lay the foundation for some future streams where we really dive deep into device management, uh, graphics drivers, networking interfaces, that kind of thing. Uh, but to start, we're going to need a grounding in the kind of system that we want to build and kind of a rough design and um, personally I need to refresh myself on a whole bunch of RISC V stuff so today we're gonna do that um, if you want to play along um, I encourage you to do so I'm planning to uh, post the source code uh, the repositories um, at the end of each stream I'll make sure they're um, set up in a way that you can like pull from any part that you want. Um, but if my screen looks good, I'm hoping you can read the text of the manual on the right and the IDE on the manual on the left, IDE on the right. Uh, if anything is unclear or anything like you have a question or you want me to go over something again um, or you think what I've said is not quite right, uh, please feel free to interrupt, ask questions. Um, and we'll kind of go through this together. Uh, thank you, Zeno, for the follow. Okay. So. I have created an empty repository here that I've called Pseudo OS or Pseudos. I think that's a cute name. Uh, but before we write anything, um, we're going to go through the very basics and start with we're going to uh, read some parts of the risk 5 instruction set manual uh, so for those who have not encountered um, risk 5 before um, it's an open um, instruction set architecture um, very very few uh, instructions compared to something like um, x86 um, and it's very nice because we've got both these very nice open manuals that we can kind of learn from, grok through, and kind of get up to speed with what we want to create. Um, there are two manuals that are going to be useful for like the first few parts of uh, these streams. Uh, one is, first is volume one, the unprivileged ISA. And the second is volume two, uh, which is the privileged architecture that goes through um, some of the uh, supervisor mode and machine mode registers um, and special instructions that's, that are only available to um, privileged um, actors on the system. Because you know, we're building an OS, um, we're definitely going to want to um, access some of those registers uh, and you know, do things later on like paging and you know, setting up page tables, setting up virtual memory addresses. Um, restricting certain domains, setting up multiple threads, that kind of stuff. So, first thing I want to do here is jump to uh, the ah, so yeah, something to probably get through. Um, there is a base instruction set uh, for risk 5 which kind of goes through some very basic um, integer instructions, um, you know, basic branching, control transfer, jumps, uh, register manipulation, a couple of memory ordering instructions, and things like um, system calls or environment calls and traps. Uh, there are a bunch of other extensions uh, to those, uh, things we're doing multiplication, division, uh, atomic instructions. We're probably only first going to restrict ourselves to the very, very basic stuff, and we'll add instructions, we'll add extensions as we like need them and encounter them. Uh, but I want to kind of keep the 
the uh, domain that we're in pretty small for now. So, to start with, I'm going to open up the assembly handbook. So, most of the risk machines we're going to most of the risk machines we're going to deal with are going to have uh, 32 main registers. Um, and there is a standard calling convention for using these registers, and we are going to stick to that for now, um, just because it's going to make our life a bit easier, and it means we can take advantage of uh, some of the built-in pseudo instructions, rather than having to write everything in terms of the very limited um, uh, instruction set that, that RISC provides. Uh, so for example, um, Here's like the base assembly that we're going to be working with here. Uh, you can see that some of these instructions like, um, like call and ret are actually composed of uh, specific small level instructions like um, jump and link register um, that reference specific registers um, and specific offsets and stuff. And we're going to be using those just to uh, make life easier for ourselves rather than writing out these particular things each time. We can you know, use call and rat and all that kind of lovely stuff. Um, yeah, most of these are very straightforward. Um, they're pretty intuitive from the names if you've ever encountered um, any kind of assembly language before. Um, you know, load instructions, um, not negations. Uh, the branch instructions are pretty straightforward. And in fact, they map pretty nicely to um, the branches. One very interesting fact. Oh, probably depends who you are. Uh, but uh, the first register is usually hardwired to zero, x zero, uh, which can make doing uh, certain. Uh, <laughs> so you find that in these pseudo instructions, a lot of them reference specifically x zero to do, you know, branch of not equal to zero, branch of equal to zero, that kind of stuff. So. Let's jump to the privileged um, document and let's go down and read this here. Uh, figure one, one shows some of the possible software stacks that can be supported by the RISC V architecture. And so, yeah, we've got three, uh, we're kind of going to ignore this last one here, um, hypervisors and stuff, um, just because they're not relevant to us, at least not at the moment. <laughs> and so we've got um, the two basic modes we'll probably be dealing with first. Uh, the first is this, um, you know, we've got a very basic application, uh, application execution environment that presents an ABI to a single application. Uh, thank you for the follow pondering elephant literal day zero. That's the plan, yeah. I need to refresh myself, and I think a lot of people, um, basically want to make sure that everyone has like a grounding, and we can kind of build up from there. And so this is the kind of model that I think we're gonna work towards. Uh, we can always change this as time goes on, uh, depending on what people want to explore. Um, if we want to spend, you know, lots of time down in the you know, supervised execution environment, you know, looking at memory page addresses and all that, that's great. Or we can very quickly kind of build up a very um, clunky operating system that gets us to user level applications, you know, um, unprivileged architectures, that, that kind of stuff. Um, so, in most RX5 systems, there are uh, four modes, um, three modes that one through that. Uh, so we've got the uh, the machine that has access to literally everything. There is this uh, supervisor mode that has access to things. That, uh, usually you want to run your OS in supervisor mode. Um, use the basically quickly jump from machine mode which has access to all registers, all mappings, all memory. Lay out your some basic structures, jump to supervisor mode, um, 
finalize some, some paging and stuff. Usually you want to, uh, let me back myself up here. Uh, so we're going to aim to make this multi-core from the start. Um, so in that, in that sense, what we will, the architecture that I will start with at least, I think you thank you for the follow is, uh, we'll start every core in machine mode. We'll pick one core, uh, usually um, cores in RISC-V are called hearts. So we'll pick heart zero as being our, our setup. Uh, we'll use that to um, put the machine in a state where every core has access to a, a unique segment of memory. Uh, to start with, we'll, we'll probably just have these cores be trusted uh, to not overwrite other people's memory, but later on, if people want to explore, um... <laughs> cool. <laughs> That's cool. I did not know that. Um... Well, yeah, if, if later on, we can, like, give each heart a, um, a virtual address so it can only access uh, memory that we've mapped to it in machine mode and then given to it. Um, and then... You know, as we build out um, the structure of the operating system, we'll eventually want to jump to user mode. Um, and in that mode, we'll be entirely dependent on system calls to get access to any part of the operating system that we haven't specifically given to um, that, that part of memory. Uh, does that all make sense? Have I missed anything? Is anything confusing? Thank you, Bacteloralis, for the follow. If not, uh, I will just kind of go through some of the control and status registers that um, we're going to be touching um, in our very basic bootloader. So the in machine mode and in supervisor mode, we have access to a bunch of special registers. And yeah, here are some of them. And so these are things like um, you know, the internal timer for the processor, some performance information. Um, uh, where is the machine? Here we go. MHART ID is the um, kind of main one we'll be using for, to allow a, um, a hardware thread to read its own um, identifier. And we're going to be using that right at the start to determine which cores we want to do stuff on and which cores we want to leave idle for a while. Um, we've got the M status register, which we're going to be using to set things like uh, memory, uh, uh, memory layout and paging. Uh, we've got the ISA, which we're going to be using to read what extensions we have access to and some, some CPU information. Um, and I think that's really, oh yeah, and later on, I don't know if we'll get to this today, um, but later on we'll be using the um, interrupt registers and the trap handler registers to be able to handle things like divide by zero errors, um, trying to execute invalid memory, uh, to kind of call back into a higher level, um, a higher level mode and handle those errors appropriately. Um, and that will help us later on, especially when we've got user mode um, code that's running. If it tries to do something weird, we'll be able to handle that in the operating system itself. Cool. Uh, yeah, so most of these other registers we won't be touching too much. Uh, we'll probably, uh, just for funsies, grab things like the cycle counter and like performance stuff just to kind of play with and see that they're there. Um, I think for now, uh, we will kind of, uh, these documents are very detailed. They give you a lot of different layouts. Um, and most of the time, we'll be referring back to specific instructions when we need them. So uh, to start with, we are going to define the machine that we're going to be working on. and. Play, so that people can play along and we don't need any hardware to start. We're going to be using Keymoon and we're going to be using the uh, RISC-V uh, vert address on Keymoon, which I've got. Uh, that is the bootloader. That is the A instructions. Do I have 
this open? Probably not. Uh, cool. So let's go to Kimi and Bert. Uh, that'll be useful. Yeah. So it's just the Kimu docs, and this specifies um, the machine that we're going to be writing an operating system for, at least to start with. Um, later on, we can add different devices to this or change the specification, you know, maybe depending on how people want to explore, we can look at going backwards into the bootloader or going you know, forwards into some um, more random devices. Uh, but to start with, um, we have up to eight cores. We can choose whether we want 32-bit or 64-bit. Uh, we're going to have a local interrupter. Uh, we're going to have the the flick controller, which is going to be used for um, things like getting the time and um, a few other things we might set up. Yeah, we probably won't do APIC to start with. Um, we'll just have a nice little basic pick and a couple of other things too. And so, do they have. Yeah, okay. So. I think I should have all of this installed already. The um, thing with RISC, um, thing with RISC V is you are going to need a special toolkit for compiling. Uh, there are instructions to uh, go build this, uh, which I probably should have looked at beforehand. But I think there's like a nice little GitHub repository that you can go to and. Uh, so this will give you everything that you need to cross compile to RISC-V architecture sets. So that includes an assembler, linker, a C compiler. Uh, for start with, we're going to write everything in assembly um, until we really, really, really need to jump to C and something higher. Um, doing that just because it's fun. And I think the lower level that we can stick to for now um, the easier some of these initial concepts are going to be. Once we've laid that kind of groundwork, we can jump to a, a higher level language like C or Rust, depending on you know, what people want to explore. Um, I'll dump this link into chat. Um, people who want to play along, and I suppose I should probably start making a readme here. Uh, let's go with getting started. You'll need <laughs> to do, yeah, exactly. Uh, you will need a S5 toolchain, which you can acquire using the instructions at. Uh, in particular, the tools that we'll be using um, this section are uh, what is it? Yes, yeah. So we'll be using the assembler, we'll be using the linker, and the OD. Yeah, cool. And Thank you, Texter, for the follow. You will also need a uh, Kimu Risk Five, which the instructions for installing, compiling, can be found here. I'll dump that in chat too. Almost. And the final thing we are going to need today is uh, Kimu. Uh, so this is going to be the um, kind of Bible for the machine that we're going to lay out, rather than trying to grab from um, 
documentation, we're going to look directly at how the emulator is written in Kimu, which has things like the memory mapping addresses right there in a nice little table. So you can see that like um, the UART drivers are here and you know Vodio starts here and PCI is here. And that's going to be very helpful to us, at least when we're starting um, and we're trying to explore some of the devices that we can interact with. Um, we will also want to reference the script.c uh, implementation for Kimu's emulator. Okay, put that in here too. So let's get Kimu running. It should be very straightforward because for now we're going to ignore pretty much everything else and find a very quick So yeah, so our Kimu parameters, let me get these out of here for now, dump them here. So to go through this kind of line by line, we've got the Kimu system RISC-64, 64-bit RISC-V. Um, we're going to use the virtual machine, which is um, specified and documented in the link just provided, 64-bit. Um, uh, we're going to start up four hardware cores. Uh, we're going to give ourselves 120 megabytes, 128 megabytes of RAM, which is, you know, a lot. You can do a lot with that. Um, no graphics to start with. Eventually, we will probably hook in a, a BGA graphics device um, or maybe something a bit more exotic, depending on, you know, how we feel. Uh, we are going to hook in um, a serial interface so that we can... Um, mostly get information out of the operating system to start through the UART interface. And we'll do a little bit of that today when we're writing our bootloader. We are not going to specify a BIOS, at least for now. We're going to just let Kimu jump straight into the, um, straight into the kernel. Uh, we do not need this. We do not need that. And we don't need any networking at the start, or none of this, and we don't need keyboard. And finally, we're going to have kernel parameter, and this is going to be our actual kernel. Um, I'm going to call it like kernel.elf for now. And so once we've built our kernel, uh, we should be able to run it with these, um, with this, with this command, but. So that we're going to actually need to write a kernel, so let's go do that. Okay, we're going to link our script. So, touch. Not touch. Yeah. UART happens to be the easiest way to get information out, especially when we're starting. Um, it's still a fairly universal <laughs> interface. Everything on the planet implements it. And um, later on, we will explore other fun ways of getting information out. But yeah, I/O right now isn't the main um, isn't the main goal. <laughs> so I'd like to keep it simple. Okay, so touch, uh, link script. What are we going to call this? We're going to call this linker. What do I used to call this? Oh, yes. Okay, so let's call this uh, kernel. Oh, yes. Dot plan. Thank you for the follow. Okay, this is going to be. I'm just going to grab a. Um, 
a very bare bones linker script. And we can go through it and just explain the various parts of it. But I'm not going to write all this out on the screen. So. Output architecture. This five. Pretty straightforward. Find an entry. This is going to be our start symbol. This is where we're going to jump to when um, we we're going to give Kimu an elf file. That elf file is going to contain a start address. That start address is going to point to the very start of our bootloader, and that's where we're going to go from. We're going to find some memory. We're going to start at this address because that's what Kimu expects us to start at, and we're going to give ourselves 128 megabytes of RAM. We're going to set up some segments, text segments for uh, programming stuff, um, data for initialized data, and BSS for uninitialized data. Um, none of these are going to be very useful, at least to start with, uh, not until we jump to um, you know, a higher level language that expects to have these kinds of things. Hi, Inoculant. How are you today? And finally, we're going to uh, provide a, a memory start label uh, which will come in handy later on when we want to tell the kernel where RAM starts at. Um, eventually, we're going to extend this to have um, information like um, you know, we might want to define some special memory segments for uh, BS itself, for stacks, um, for, for the heap. We might want to find separate heaps for each uh, for each heart. But for now, we're going to keep it very, very simple. The goal is to get something up and running and working. Um, are there any questions about our very basic linker script? Awesome. Okay, so touch boot dot s. Look at that. So beautiful already. Okay, so some boilerplate to start with. So let's not generate no VSC, don't generate compressed instructions. Um, empty data section because we don't want anything there. Uh, we're going to start our actual program. We're going to reference our global. And here's our start. And we are going to just wait for interrupts. Okay. Uh, give me one second. This should compile, hopefully, and it should do nothing. Uh, so we are going to do risk uh, assembly uh, compile thing to boot dot o. So this is a this is our risk sixty four assembler. It's going to take in our um, our tiny little bootloader. That all it does it's going to start, and then the cores are going to immediately wait for. Uh, interruptions, and that's it. And we're going to compile it to boot.o, which is our object, and ambiguous possibilities. What is wrong here? What did I forget? Oh, we don't actually need this, do we? Nope. Why are you complaining? Oh. Okay. O. Some of the warning, end of file is not end of line, new line, set it. Okay. Awesome. No warnings, no nothing. It compiles. I'm going to throw this into our readme for now. So, compiling power bootloader.
Then we're gonna link, which is risk explorer LD. This is going to take in our root.l. It's gonna take in our linker script. And we're gonna output our kernel.elf file. And it needs a minus T. Awesome. That compiles. Will these videos have a permanent home? Uh, the plan, yeah, the plan is eventually I am recording these um, as I'm streaming them and I will probably upload them to YouTube um, once we get a chance. So we have our compilation step and we have our linking step. And so what this has done is it's created a YouTube channel. Uh, yeah. Where is it? Here we go. it is currently empty um, double check that this actually goes somewhere yeah so uh, yeah once these are um, finished and I will probably edit them down um, uh, I will post some stuff there Okay, uh, where is my ID gone? There it is, awesome. So we have a compilation step, which is gonna take our assembler and create an object file. That's just the compiled assembler to um, RISC-64 um, machine code. And then we've got our linker file, which is going to create a, a, an ELF file that's going to have information about how to lay out our objects in memory such that Hemu can actually load them and execute them properly. And so if we now run our system command. Nothing happens and Kimu freezes, which is the expected result. I don't actually think I can even kill it with control C. So we're just gonna have to P kill Kimu. Awesome. There we go, we were a little bit later. Obviously, this is just the start. Are there any questions at this point about any of the setup that we've done? Awesome, thank you, Pondering Elephant. Cool, so our next step is going to be to set up some very basic structure in our um, in our little bootloader and kind of start the process of building out our um, our system. So as I mentioned before, we have set up this machine with four cores. So what's basically happening right now is all four hardware threads are starting up at the same time and they're all um, jumping down into um, waiting for interrupts. What we want to do is we want to make this um, uh, what we want to do is we want to have hardware thread zero actually do the setup for us while all the other hardware threads go to sleep and that will ensure that we're not clobbering we don't have multiple threads clobbering for memory right when we start up. So to do that, we're going to have to read one of the system registers that I was talking about right at the start. So let's pull up that documentation again. And to many browser threads open. And let's go find the um, mHeartID register. Here it is. 
So the MHOT ID at register is an MXLAN bit read-only register containing the integer ID of the hardware thread running the code. This register must be readable in any implementation, so we can kind of guarantee that no matter what RISC-V system we're running on, we need to be able to read this thread, even if it's only got one um, hardware thread. Hardware threads might not necessarily be numbered contiguously, uh, but at least one hard ID must have a hard ID of zero. So we know that hardware thread zero is always going to be available on the system. Doesn't matter how many, um, how many hardware threads we have or how they're numbered, there will always be a hardware thread zero. And we know that hardware threads must be unique. So assuming that a RISC-V system is created correctly, <laughs> You know, it, you know, it does comply to the system. We can assume that there will be a hardware thread zero and that there will be no other hardware thread with, with the ID of zero. And yeah, in certain cases, we must ensure exactly one heart runs some code at reset. And so one heart must have, you know, one heart will have a known ID of zero. For efficiency system, they should aim to replace them, reduce the magnitude of the largest heart ID used in the system. So, the um, so yeah, the risk five specification doesn't you know, mandate that you number your hardware threads, you know, zero to however many you have, but it does kind of gently nudge you towards that uh, uh, towards that conclusion. So we're going to read this uh, MHOT ID to start with, and we're going to throw it into a register. And to do that, we're going to need the, um, the CSR read assembly instruction, I think. Is it CSR, is there an assembly? Store instructions. The CSR is that a it's going to CSR R CSR R W, which will be to write to the register. Oh, because it's going to depend on. I'll just start with this read word, read short, right? Okay. Refreshing my uh, assembly knowledge here. So we're going to want to read. See, I just a general one. Can I find it in here? See, that's. Uh, ah, yeah, here we go. Uh, so, read the cycle counter, read the clock. Read the CSR, so we've got, ah yeah, okay, so we've got CSR, so read, uh, read word, read short, read, uh, clear, ah, okay, so set, clear, write, read, okay, that makes more sense. Cool, so we want to read the MHA ID register. So we're going to want to do CSRR. We're going to want to put this into a register. They're putting into RD. Right. Refreshing myself on the um register calling conventions here. It's been about two years since I've written any RISC-V assembly. So yeah, this is just saying I can say RD and then CSR. Okay. So 
Uh, yeah, so I should be able to do something like put this into T0, which is the temporary register, right? Or like one of the temporary registers. Temporary alternative link register. Cool. And we're going to want mHeart ID as the register that we want to read. Yeah. And we're going to want to do branch if not zero, uh, T zero. And we're going to want to, if it's not zero, we're going to want the branch to um, like um, a wait. And that's going to do a, a wait for instruct, a wait for um, interrupt. And right now, I think, I think by default, interrupts are disabled across most. Um, we'll double check that. Um, yeah, because you don't have an intro handler, then why should they go? Um, okay, so when we read that, branch not zero, we're going to go to wait. Uh, that should be correct. Branch not zero, read offset, awesome. And then we're going to want to see if this compiles. So basically, we won't be able to see anything happen that's different, uh, but we will at least be able to confirm that assembly is correct. So we want to assemble, looks good, link, and run. Nothing has changed, everything's waiting around, we've got no way of outputting to the system. So right now we just have an empty screen, all the cores are waiting, and they will wait forever. Kill teammate. Awesome. Okay, so let's try and do something interesting with um, call what? core zero so that we can confirm that one that there's only one core doing anything and that we can confirm that um, that everything else is kind of set up correctly so to do that we're going to just jump out um, a value to um, the console and so to do that we are going to need to reference Kimi docs and we'll find that by default, Kimu is going to map a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of stuff to uh, the memory layout that we're working with. Uh, so somewhere down here we have UART zero, and that's going to be at this memory address. So this memory address we have the UART zero device, and we will be able to use that to uh, dump some serial output to the console and actually get information out of our very small bootloader. So to do that, we should probably pull up the UART uh, specs. Uh, UART. have some interesting things in here or is it just going to tell me pretty bits that might be enough I might, might just need to be able to grab the OS dev wiki OS development is like 95% reading docs and 5% writing code and that might be optimistic Common find and personal computers, um, common interfaces, I believe, actually that's uh, Kimu, UART, I think Kimu has its own special serial, okay, go right to the source. Right, so we're going to have to configure UART just to um, get it ready to dump some bits out and go from there. That isn't going to be very helpful though. Um, where is there a good place we can dump this out? 
probably have an older... Right, okay. Okay, so let's try and work out how to dump the TUR. Um, I do not want to read C to work out how to dump the TUR. That's not going to happen. Port addresses, port addresses not gonna happen. Bits, data bits, stop bits, parity bits, interrupts. Right now, I'm just trying to remind myself how this works. Ah, oh, we got some nice little code here. Uh, but that's going to be specific to um, writing. So. Yeah, so this is going to be disabling all interrupts, enabling auto uh, advisor, e, set device, the, e, that's this common setup, so, but we don't want to communicate with that. Yeah. Okay, let's just sketch this out and then we can fill in the blanks. So we're going to want some kind of, like, um, let's say, write you up. Right? And we know that per the um, Kimi specifications, it should be at this memory address. Um, So what we're going to do here is <laughs> counting from zero is the only way to go, I think. Okay. I really wish I could find some nice human view out docs. Aha. Really? Oh yeah, this looks good. whole bunch of cool interesting information here that is not relevant to what we want to do. Pin descriptors, following descriptions, functions of all UART pins. So we've got receiver buster, transmitter holding, register write, interrupt enable, and latch here. More, how to wire. Find control register. System programmer may access any of the UART registers summarized in Table 2 via the CPU. These registers control UART operations, including transmission and reception of data. Each register bit in Table 2 has its name and reset states shown. Uh, 
Uh, there's no command for project summary, but I can quickly go through it here. We're just writing a very basic bootloader and kind of refreshing some very basic uh, systems programming knowledge for RISC-V. Uh, so we can kind of lay a groundwork for building some more complex operating system projects later on. Uh, later on, I'll make sure all this code is available in a Git repository. Um, and kind of as we go through the weeks, as we go through these streams, we'll kind of build on what we've got. So, System Programmer specifies the format of the asynchronous data communication exchange and sets the device latch access bit via the line control register. The programmer can also read the contents of the line control register. The read capability simplifies system programming and eliminates the need for separate storage in system memory of the line characteristics. So, uh, for the line control register, bit 0 and 1 specify the number of bits in each transmitted or received serial character. The encoding of bit 0 and 1 is as follows. So, if it's 0, 0, 5 bit characters, if it's 1 and 0, 8 bit characters, if it's 1 and 1, we've got 8 bit characters. Um, so, we're probably going to want to set this to use 8 bit characters, um, at least to start. Uh, thank you, Nick Rosa, for the follow. Uh, bit 2, this bit specifies the number of stop bits transmitted and received in each serial character. If bit 2 is 0, um, one stop bit is generated in the transmitted data. If bit 2 is 1, um, when a 5 bit word length is selected by bit 0 and 1, oh, I love this, um, or 8 bit word, uh, if bit 2 is a logic 1, either a 6, 7, or 8-bit word length is selected. Two stop bits are generated. The receiver checks the first stop bit only, uh, regardless of the number of stop bits selected. Bits 3 is the parity enable bit, um, which will be some... Oh, it'll throw some parity in there. Even parity select bit. When bit 3 is 1, bit 4 is 0, the odd number of logic ones is transmitted or checked. Um, so right now we, are, we don't really need to worry about any of these because we are emulating this in software. And unless something goes very, very wrong or a cosmic ray flips, we don't care if we're going to get bits weird. Uh, so what is the default in the line control register in Kiwi? Uh, so let's take a look down. Is there, a, is there a create in here somewhere? Serial. Uh, it's going to throw some stuff in here. Uh, TSR. So yeah, this is what we see in those things here, uh, start bit, it checks parity bits, all that kind of stuff, data bits, great. Okay, so let's see if we can dump a character. So, when the CPU access AR, the UART freezes all interrupts and indicates the highest priority interrupt to the CPU. So we don't really care about reading right now. And we actually don't care about like, we don't care about receiving data from the UART. We only care about dumping out. So, I guess what we can do here is Okay, you should just be able to dump something out. Okay, so for now, that's just like, uh, what's the un... Wait, 
unrestricted jump J. Yeah, this J. Let's jump T right you up. And so we've got this here. So let's um, load a let's load an immediate into uh, T1. And we'll say that immediate is going to be uh, 0x64, which should be a capital A. And then we are going to write out to that memory address, which is SW. Yeah. What is the actual structure of that? Ah, store. So SB. B PI missing here. Font size plus plus. Uh, you got it. Um, uh, font size on the PDF or the ID or both. Oh, in increase both. Increase both. ID. Cool. Uh, settings. Uh, font. 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 So like 20, yeah. Uh, how is that? Is that better? Missing something here because it says it's three. Um, let's see if this compiles. Illegal operands always good. Okay, so oh, cause yeah, because we're gonna need to do uh, li. Uh, T uh, two. We're gonna need the actual address that we want to go, and then we should be able to do something like this. And it's gonna hate that. Does that need a? Oh. Um. Oh, is it missing an X?
So if all goes well, this should just dump A and quit. D. Did I? Okay, that's dump something and quit. So it's probably a configuration issue, or I have forgotten how ASCII works. One six four is an at sign, not um, an A, which would be sixty five. My guess is that we need to configure uh, this to use 8-bit characters. So let's go back to our um, click and let's go look at this. So this is line control register. We got something out, so we are hitting the right address. We're just not um, configuring our system properly. So. Okay, system progress specifies the format of the asynchronous data communication line and sets uh, X bits. So we've got this line control register and we need to set the top two bits to 1-1 one, one if we want 8-bit characters. I know that's something to do, so I wonder if we can do something like hello, Q3, um, actually is there an offset we need to be referencing here? How does Kimo do this? Um, Updates, if we're updating, throwing these in, same the parity, bits, data bits is plus five. Okay. Okay, let's go back here. sense of right. uh, let me do this out for a sec. Uh program blog generator line stats register by putting this web control register, scratch by register. Yes, there's a whole bunch of information here that we need to pull. Or at least be aware of where it is in relation to the um machine. Register addresses. Okay. Uh, so yeah, zero 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 is the is used to both receive and write. And then the line um line control register is 
at um, one, two, three. All right. Yeah. And I guess that's what. Yeah. So this is saying, yeah, disable and interrupt which we should probably do. And then we're setting a whole bunch of things here, but it's using port three and it's setting it to this. So yeah, let's just try to start with. Let's load up into T1003. Uh, we can keep TT here. Actually, first, let's make this TT and let's make our uh, things T1 just to keep things a little better and so we can then do that which should set eight big characters um, yeah so if we boot this now illegal operands t3 yeah e well that's wrong so I'm just going to take a quick break, but I'll be back and then we'll work through this. Okay. So, I think what we're going to do is we're going to work through these uh, UART settings one at a time until we get to the point where we can dump an A. And at that point, we can create a setup UART that just configures it down to what we would like. And we can go back and refer to the UART uh, manual to kind of break down some of these steps. So, loading the UART address. Oh, right. That was silly of me. Okay, so, first things first. We need to add to this address. Uh, rather than do that in um, Code. I'm just going to dump this for now. So this is the line control register. So here we want to write out to the UART line control register at UART UART plus three. And this is going to uh, set uh, the output to eight bits.
And let's see what this does to us. So ooh. Okay, so let's um thank you, Jang Tron, for the follow. How are you today? So let's uh let's also just disable interrupts here. that we want to set this to zero and that, for that we can actually just use x zero here because we also need the board rate divisor yeah okay so assembly probably should write a make script at some point for this i don't think so negwasa uh, but especially not on Kumu, uh, but just be safe. Um, so what we'll probably do is remove some of these as and when we need them. Because I do not want to complicate this any more than it needs to be. And configuring like you are, it shouldn't take this much time. So, um, yeah. So let's try setting this. I know that's like that. Um, so just, I'm going to look at my old lot code here and just see what the minimum, uh, minimum viable UART is. Uh, so we've got X2 here. Uh, we're storing the byte t6 in x2. What do you want? Really? Yeah, so I. Okay. Something is weird here. So yeah. I suppose we should uh, check the empty. But it should be because we're not using it. So it's like eh. Uh, so just double check here. Oh, is this getting I have here in my older stuff. Um, I load X2, which is the address of the UART, and then we pull in the actual from five. So we add one to two five. So it's going to be that. But yeah, this just loads the byte into T5, and oh, do I need? Ah, okay. I think I know what's going on. Does this need this? In which case, do they all need this? Okay. Dad Robot Dev, thank you for the follow. Hope you're having a good day. So I wonder if this has changed since uh, 
time I did this, in which case, oh, are we just in a different, Well, let's try it in C6. Let's play it. Oh, and it also does that. Okay. Magic upset when it loads. But I'm loading an intermediate, so unless I'm getting screwed up by. Am I getting screwed up by like ending this here? Shouldn't be, right? I am doing great, um, Dead Robot Dev. Yeah, this is uh, it's pretty fun. Um, oh my God, Hex zero six. Oh my God. Okay, nope, everything is working completely fine here. E is correct because I cannot read sixty five decimal is not sixty five hex. <laughs> so now. Yay! We have an A, and we've only got one A being printed. <laughs> Isn't it magic? Look at that. So yeah, so some interesting experiments that we can do now. We can remove our little branching code here, right? Like we can disable this, and so all the UARTs are going to attempt to, uh, sorry, all the hearts are going to attempt to write out the UART. what we get is four A's being printed, um, one after the other, just because of the way things are being scheduled. And it's because Emu is going, uh, Kimu is going to naturally, like, match access to that in the background. Um, awesome. So we now have a way of getting information out of our bootloader. We've got some, like, the minimum viable output. So we can now start having some fun. Not that this wasn't fun. Already, I think you're all having fun, right? <laughs> okay, so let's turn that back on. So, let's clean up our OHART, uh, our UART setup here. So let's create a new function. It's called like setup UART. And this is going to do everything up until here. And it's going to return. And so now we should be able to do call setup. Yeah. And then we should be able to call yep, and then call like halt. And let's make this nice and let's just have everything halt for now. Uh, if I remember Kimu right, this might. Oh, halt is in. Ah, okay, it's working with us. Can't be able to work out what that is. Uh, so let's just make sure that our. Uh, well, it works. We have an A, we have one A, everything looks like it's being set up properly. Awesome. Okay, so kind of to summarize where we are so far, we've uh, written a little linker um, that will compile, take our assembly and compile it into a format that Kimu knows how to run and execute. 
when, em when Kimi boots up, it's going to call our start function. And it's going to call that start function on the four hardware threads that we kind of specified that our little system has. Um, the first thing that all of those hardware threads are going to do is they're going to, they're going to read their, um, their unique identifier from the mHeartID register, which is a special RISC-V register. And they're going to read that to their own um, T0 register. So every heart has its own set of registers. Um, that's important to uh, understand. Uh, then they're going to branch. If their T heart is not zero, they're going to fall down into our little wait function and they're just going to wait there forever. Meanwhile, heart zero is going to set up UART, which is going to allow us to talk out to the world. And finally, right now, we have our little write UART function. And all that write UART function does is print A to the console uh, to let us know that everything is working as expected. Uh, are there any kind of questions about where we are, anything that's not clear, anything that you want me to kind of go over again? Or um, otherwise we can like jump ahead and start um, fleshing out our write UART function so we can actually start printing out like strings and system information um, and kind of get as much information as we can out of uh, the system. Awesome. Cool. So, let's open up, go to log message. Uh, which log message do you mean? Oh, good. Ah, right. Okay. Good luck. Okay. So let's get everything set back up here. And let's uh, create a little data segment now that we've got some data that we want to uh, we want to use. So create a little section called data. And I'm just going to create a little uh, welcome message here in ASCII. It's going to say something like, welcome to pseudo CDOS. CDOS. Yeah, and let's throw a little thing in there. Okay, um, let's make sure that is correct in its structure. Looks good. So we're going to use the um, the UR, uh, the RISC V calling convention here, um, and we're which is uh, function arguments get put in uh, a zero um, to a seven. So we are going to use register a zero to um, put. Uh, to, to develop a kind of write UART function. Uh, so I'm going to load uh, load this is going to be a a word a zero and that's going to be our welcome. I think I'm going to have to nope that should be fine. And then we're going to call write you up. And so in write you up, we are going to then load into T0, T1 that. And instead of using 65 now, we are going to load the value that is in the register address in A0. So if I remember my risk 5 correctly, we are going to need to call, yeah, okay. So we now call, actually, can we just use 
a lie. It's not like the... LB. Yeah, okay. So we can call LB and T0, and we want to grab the address. Uh, we want to call the value that is in A0. Uh, we then want to branch if 0 to um, write you out end. It's just going to be a return. Branch of zero, um, t2 to write your end. Branch of zero. Otherwise, we are going to write that byte out to the address that's in t1, and then we are going to jump back to write you up. Uh, technically, we this is a bit of a the instruction, but that's okay. Uh, so this should just loop through and it should print out our message. So, yes. LB. Well, that was unexpected. Uh, so there is a bug somewhere. Oh, of course, um, so there's two bugs. First is that we're not incrementing A0. So we need to, uh, yeah. <laughs> so once we have written that out, we need to uh, add, um, actually, is there like an ink instruction? No, we'll just add. Um, Yep, so let's just uh, add a0, put the result in a0, and we're going to need uh, load into t2, uh, the value 1, to add that to that to that. I think the second bug here is um, the actual data that we are loading. I think it's not being assembled properly. Okay. Nope. Okay. Uh, oh. Is that a problem? That might be a problem. All right, illegal operands. Okay. <gasps> Load absolute address. Okay, yeah. That makes much more sense. Helps you recompile before you do anything. And welcome to Sudas. We have actual text. Isn't that exciting? Isn't this the best OS ever? <laughs> and we've only got printed out once, so um, we can be rest assured that our, it's actually working correctly. So, ship it! Exactly! Exactly! What more do you want in a bootloader? Like, we're managing a resource, we're setting it up, we're managing some threads, looking great. Uh, let's just make sure that we can um, like do some multiple things here. If I throw in a new line character, um, let's call you out twice. Uh, so we've got one, and we're going to a new line, but we're not... Oh, of course, because we're um, incrementing it. That's silly. Uh, so that. So we need to load that again. 
because there's no guarantee that A0 remains untouched after the calling convention. In our case, it definitely doesn't. And so this should print it out twice. Great, we have actual line outputs here. Uh, two. Okay, this is exciting. Before I forget, I'm just going to commit everything that we've got so far. Uh, Brief.s, uh, tell. Uh, LDS. Let's create a git ignore file. And let's add uh, star.o files and star. Elf files. That should. And no one wants my IDE configs. Cool. Initial bootloader. Okay, so we have a very, very scrappy bootloader. And so now the world is our oyster. We are in, we have our kernel, we have access to all of memory. Um, so I think what we're going to do now is just kind of pull a few registers, uh, see what the setup is, and basically just dump a bunch of information um, about the machine. And then we can use that later on to craft the operating system however we want. So I think first, let's go to the privilege thing and let's take a look at some of the registers that we can look at and go from there. Um, Machine level CSRs. Is there a summary of this somewhere? Um. Render ID, architecture ID, heart ID. I guess. That's probably a good place to start, um, since we've already got it. Uh, let's do Vulcan. I am heart. Read this into here. I want to make this a function at some point uh, so we can like print out each heart in turn just to make sure that we're like pulling them up correctly. Um, and then we want to uh, load in uh, say the T1 uh, ring offset, which is uh, 30. Double check my ASCII because I've already been wrong once this stream. Um, 30. Awesome. Uh, so let me get 30. Uh, add to T1. Oh, sorry, add to T0. Uh, T1. And just dump it out to A0. Call right. Nope, so we're going to need memory address here. Uh, what's the best way of doing this? Do you have scratch register with these? Um, just dump it to some random memory to start with. Uh, 
yeah, I guess now is the time to kind of, um, we should probably set up this, some little scratch pad in memory. Eventually this might become our stack, um, but for now let's just call it like a scratch pad. And uh, what is it? It's a skip. Um, Thank you, uh, CypherText, for the follow. I hope you're having a good day. Skip, skip, integer, value. While generating values to the data section, the dot skip directive causes integer bytes to be skipped over or optionally filled with a specific value. Uh, so yeah, that's just, we probably don't want that to be an executable memory for now. Uh, so yeah, let's just, uh, let's just get like 10 bytes or whatever. 1,024 bytes, why not? And so let's uh, load into T3. Uh, load the absolute address of sketchpad into T3. Um, let's write this out to T2, and then we're going to have to store. Um, yeah. Store the byte address into the value that's in T3. Always happy to see more coding streams on Twitch, especially because there are very few doing low level things. I, I think so too. I think it's. I think this kind of programming is very fun, it's very visceral, and it makes you feel very connected to the machines. Um, and it's been a little while since I've done this kind of stuff, so. I'm definitely having fun, and I hope that uh, others are too. So we're gonna store that into Scratchpad, and now we can load the absolute address of Scratchpad back into A0, and we can dump out um, and call you out, right? Uh, why am I instead of you out? Oops. Boop. Um, so yeah, we're loading that to C0. We're loading Scratchpad in. We are adding, we are storing that into T2. That looks wrong. Okay, so this should say, hello, I'm heart zero. Um, let's see if it does. Uh, didn't the undefined reference to right. Oh, of course, because this should be right you at. Um, we're going to write a I am hot. Nothing. Okay. Let's go through what we've got here. Definitely. Okay, let's make sure where we are. So we are putting the am hot ID into T0. We are loading the immediate value of hex 30 into T1. We're adding T0 to T1, and we're putting it into um, T2. We are then loading the absolute value of Scratchpad into T3. We're storing the value that we've put in T2, which should be ASCII 0, into um, the start of Scratchpad. Uh, we're then reloading the value of Scratchpad into A0. I guess we can save an instruction by just doing that. And then we're calling you out. <laughs> I 
The assembly, I, it does take a while to get used to. And we are still not getting anywhere. So, what is wrong with this code? Let's write this out. So, grab the value of grab the heart ID. P0. Um, then we want to add 0x30 to the heart ID to get ASCII number. So this should be 0 plus 30 is 30, which is ASCII 0. We're then adding T0 to T1 and throwing it into T2. We could just put it into T0 because we don't actually need it anymore. We're then loading the address of the scratch pad. Into A0. And storing ASCII 0 into a uh, scratch pad. And then we should be writing it out. Um, so why would we not be writing this out? Just guess, just to confirm, let's just throw like a new line thing in here, which is like this. And we will put this at the bottom here, new line. We'll probably do like a special like print line function in a sec once we've got this working. I'm hot zero! Nice! Printing that out. That is awesome. So let's get a little bit of um, scheduling going on here just so we can print out all of our little hearts and we'll write a little um, write new line function to kind of build up some structure. So write new line or write line. Um, So this is going to do two things. It's going to do that. And it is going to call the out right. So the calling convention to this is A0 should contain a pointer, or contain the address of a string to print. Right line will then print this string, um, hold on, write this string to the serial UART device, followed by a new line. So now instead of doing this, we can call right line test early test often awesome so actually I'm going to create another little scratch pad here and I am going to for now just skip that one byte, one word, and then we're going to write a little function here called announce, and we're going to 
do some comparisons. Let me open up my assembly guide again. We want branch if equal to, yeah. So branch if equal to, uh, oh, load. So we want to not scratch pad, um, hot lock. So load the value, load this into a T0. Branch if equal to a T0, oh, we need hot ID, which it should be getting from here. one. So if they're equal, actually let's go if they're not equal, then we can just branch back here when it is. But if they are equal, then we want to call, um, we'll call a little hot function. Uh, so it's going to be this. Here. Boop. So add 30 to the hot ID, do a bunch of stuff, call right line, and then jump to wait. Um, load immediate. One add t at um, oh, let's keep the value of hot lock here. Um, Oh, we can only take at it, it doesn't matter. Um, log into T2, load that into T1, T0, T1, T0, and then we're going to write the value back into um, touchpad, which we are going to use this. Um, yeah, A0, we're not guaranteed to have A0 again, um, let's do that, we will clean this up as we go along, um, okay, so let's keep this in track for me, so we want to increment the hot lock, so load the value, load in 1, add T0 to T1, back into T0, Load into A0, the uh, scratch pad, uh, write T0 into the scratch pad, and jump to wait. And then right at the bottom here, we can say start um, make all hearts except zero. Wait. This is now going to go to announce. Uh, cool. Then we want to set up UART. We need to print welcome message. We no longer want to do that. No longer need to do this. And we'll just have hot zero, then jump to announce. Okay, so we're gonna check our hot ID. If we're hot zero, we're gonna continue down here to set up UARTs and print a welcome message. And then we're gonna jump to announce. Everything else is gonna jump to announce. Uh, this should just be fine. A bunch of setup instructions, which we've written. 
and then announce we're going to uh, load the uh, right yeah this is wrong so we need to load the value of hotlock not the um, absolute value so we want to make this um, load byte zero hotlock we don't need the offset uh, like that check them we're going to basically make the hots loop here while they're waiting for the lock um, and then each hot is going to announce itself in turn and then go on to the next one so that's very very nice Unrecognized opcode, bnic, t0, ti, and notes. Um, be any. Okay, so that's currently stuck at zero, and we're also not printing our welcome I am hot message. So uh, let's. Fix the first one first. So we want to print the welcome. I am heart. And then we're going to add 30. So this is the same as before. We're printing this out. So we know this works since we're printing out zero and we're writing that line. And then we want to increment the hot lock. And to do this, we need to uh, load the byte at hot lock into T0. And we need to write it out to hot lock. There we go. Oops, helps my link. LB. Okay, we're going to have hot zero now, but we're still not uh, branching, which means that something else is wrong. Uh, still a byte, t zero, print it me zero. Um, so we know this is working fine for zero. So is there something about incrementation which is weird? So we're loading the value of hotlock into T0. We're adding the intermediate value into T1. We're adding T0 to T1 and putting it into T0. We're loading the absolute address of hotlock into A0. And then we're storing the byte that is in T0 into a zero is that <laughs> the, we will eventually get to a higher level but definitely i feel it's important to get to grips with the machine before you uh before you go any further. <laughs> Helps get you situated into the environment that you're working in. Although I must say, as um, <laughs> Cybertech said, this assembly um, format is a little annoying. <laughs> um, okay, so why? Why is this not working? Why are things not halting the way they should be? Oh, of course. Okay. Load the address of hotlock into T0. Then we want to
hand try and set up a debugging environment with Kimu's remote to use up. Um, I've never done that before, but yeah, we could definitely give that a try. Get some extra information out later on. I think I know what the problem is here though, which is that we're not reading this properly. So I need to know the load the absolute address, I need to load the load that in T0, and then I want to load byte in T0. Define reference to T0 and write you up. What? I guess it doesn't like this. I don't think I've never loaded a value in a memory address. Oh, yeah, okay. I know what to do. So, yeah. So, this is going to do that. This is what we. Right, yes, let's do this. So that, that, that becomes that, this becomes that. Okay. Still not working. That is okay. Okay, load. The absolute address of hotlock into T0. Then load the byte that's in hotlock into T0. Add that to that branch if they're not equal. Does that do what I think it does? T0, T1, to an ounce. So clearly that's working because we know that the initial value is zero. So I think what's probably happening here is the reverse is incorrect so yes okay so let's do this now load value of t0 into hot block load that load the actual value into t0 add this together okay does that make more sense what am i missing here the right number of CPUs because yeah if I disable like this check here what should happen is chaos um, like everything should try to write at the same time and what we'll basically end up with is that I'm hot zero zero I'm hot zero I'm hot zero why do they all think they are hot zero That is a good question. Okay, um, let's, no, because that won't work, um, okay.
why do they all think that they are T? Oh, because T0 contains hot lock, whereas T1 contains the hot ID. So let's make that T2, make this T2, make this T1, make this T1. And keep this removed. And then if we actually run this through, everyone should print out their own. One. Yes, LV. There are four cores running, um, which we can go another off like four printouts. Uh, just for some reason, let me reload this again down here. So, let T1 to that, let T2 to that, add T1 to T2. Throw it into T1. Load the scratch pad address here. Store T1 here and write the line out. Right. That should be okay if we're not like clobbering something else. There we go. I am hot two, I am hot three, I am hot zero, I am hot one. Um now we just need to make sure that they're doing it um, in the proper turns. Yes, that's the um, that's the goal, and then we've got this increment here. I think what's just going on here is uh, we are. I tell you what we'll do. Just load this in. Store this into T zero. Add one to it. Add T zero there. Load that in and store it. And we should now. Nope. Okay. I think that if there, we know now that if there is a problem, it's going to be with. Brown should not equal T0, which should be the value of the hot lock, which we should be incrementing. Uh, T1, which will be the hot ID itself, and that will loop. Uh, I wonder if... We can just print out the value of hot lock uh, down here. It's like double check our logic. So if we create if we create a um, uh, let's not worry about that for now. Let's just uh, do the same thing we did here, which was load that in and call that. So we know this code basically works. And then we're going to use this logic up here. So. Load the absolute address of hot lock into T0. Uh, load the byte that's in there into T0. Add 30 to it to get a digit. Load our scratch pad to T1 and write it out. And yeah, I'll just change these all to T1 so that this code is the same. This will at least. Um, Double check our logic here. Oh, we might need a. Oh, we got right line here. Oh. Okay. So we're definitely like printing out a new line, but we're not. Like, there's no actual value here. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, it should, we should be incrementing. So this code here should be doing the incrementing. Um. But there's clearly a problem with it. Um, I wonder what if I I load this into T1 instead. Uh, like, is there just a problem with the way I'm reading 
this? Am I getting my syntax confused? No. So load that in. Oh, this does not then happen. Oh, I see. Okay. Nope. Load in hot ID into T1. Load 30 into T2. Add T1 to T2, start into T1. Load scratch by address into A0, store T1 into A0, write it out. So that should just be zero, right? I guess we could, I guess we should probably check that. Um... Hi, Astrosha, thank you for the follow. I hope you're doing okay today. That's just gonna gobble. Um... To basics. Yes. Make, run the machine. Guess I am hot zero and stops. Makes sense. Um. Could we be doing something weird with like other values of it? If we instead of skipping here um, directly, what if we um, just block it on? What if we put one in directly? Do we get I am hot one being printed? I am hot one. Okay, so we know that, that branch is working. We're just not putting a value in here that's correct. Oh, I wonder if this is just a word word issue. Um, so we know that's working, we know that's working. Increment is probably the thing that's not working for whatever reason. So we, let's go through this code. So we're gonna store mrid into t0. We're going to load the immediate value of t1 of uh, one into t1. We're going to add t0 to t1, and we're going to put the results into t0. So at this point, t0 should be m heart id plus one. We're going to load the absolute address of heartlock and put it into a0. And finally, we're going to store the byte that's in t0 into um, the address that points to Hotlock. This should work. Uh, I wonder if we need to store more than a byte. Because <laughs> the hot ID is MX lens long and Yeah, okay, so let's be sensible here. And MXLEN on a 64 bit system is going to be just 
is the same, I think. Each appropriate key. I was good word. I want to see if that actually impacts anything. Okay. Nothing, nothing. Okay. Um. Yeah, we're storing the byte directly, so it's not like that should actually make a difference. Bye, Cypertax. Take care. Have a good day. Okay. Byte, half word, word, double word. I mean. This is weird, and I'm not entirely sure what is going on here. Yeah, because like we are, I could just change this to be consistent. Uh, nope, let's not be that consistent. Uh, I think it's T2, we're overriding it. Right, I wonder if we, um, like what if I load an immediate value into T0 of like 1, right? We're still not getting anywhere. What is wrong with this loop? We need to start pulling out some debugging tools. Because we know if we like if we manually set like this if I set this to two right if I set this to two and kill Kimu and we compile the thing that gets printed out is I am hot too so we know that reading this value is correct and we're just filling it with all twos we're filling one byte with all twos or one you know one word with all twos. So we know that, you know, this code at least is correct. So we know that we're loading the address of hotlock into T0, and then we are loading the byte of that, the actual byte of that into that. And we know that's two because everything else works fine. So the problem then is that once we've called right line, does right line have a proper return? Yeah, that should be fine. Um, then we, we're going to pull up our hot ID again into T0. We're going to load an immediate value of 1 into T1. Was that just the problem? Nope. We're going to load the absolute address of hotlock into T2, and then we're going to write this out to T2. Like, yeah, so I just need that anyway. Um, 
So yeah, I think we're just gonna have to kind of try and print this value out and see if um, see if anything comes out. And worst case, we might just have to very quickly try and set up some debugging, see what uh, assumption we're getting wrong. Because, yeah, it's not printing anything past this point, which is weird. So let's just uh, go, um, uh, giving up control. Boom, boom, boom. So let's go here. Let's print up giving up control. Dump that message out. So we are not seeing the giving up control message, which means that something else is going on here. Um, Wait, what's going on here? Uh, oh, are we executing like an illegal instruction or something? Or, oh, we're living forever, aren't we? Of course we are. Just badly. Uh, okay, so my theory is that this probably isn't going to print any. Yeah. Okay. So. Storing the hot ID into the scratch pad. We need to clear our scratch pad. Um, so load immediate T zero a thousand twenty four. I guess. Load T1 2024 branch. Um, Michael Douglas from Brazil, thank you for the follow. I hope you're having a good day. Uh, we want to store byte zero by T2. I guess we can use x0 for that, so store by x0 into, uh, okay, load the absolute address of scratch pad into t2. Add uh, t0 to t2. Put it into T3. Um, store byte X0 into the address that's pointed to by T. Do you want to store byte here? Let's clarify some words, double words. I think we should do words here instead of. Um, Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I think we'll do this for now, into T3. Um, LI, T3, one, add T3 to T0, throw it back into T0. Branch is equal uh, T zero T one 
match it. Not equal. Match pad. Otherwise, return. Saris, and keep a follow. Hope you're having a good day. Uh, batch is not equal. Yeah, me. Now it does nothing anyway. Because I'm... Okay, let me... What was that doing? So we are running hot. We're running hot to that and that is fine so we are giving up control here and everything will be fine we'll print out giving up control because everything there is null terminated i'm hot blah giving up control why is there zero there Oh, because I am hot. Zero. Giving up control. Zero. Makes perfect sense. Okay. Uh, call my line here. Um, if we try to write that here, is where the problems begin. Because we have an infinite loop somewhere. Okay, and that infinite loop is clearly coming from somewhere in here. What is this line? This is um, risk five assembly. We have used scratch pad before here. Have we actually? We don't actually use it until we get to this point. All of this should be fine. All of this should be fine. Like, if I get rid of this, we should just be printing out. Giving up control. Okay. So we know the problem is somewhere in here. My guess is it's this call to like the right line. Like if, if we get rid of that, like no problem at all. And in fact, let me just double check something here. Like, if we get rid of this here, we'll just do this. Do we get four calls here now? No. Okay. Azazel, thank you for the follow. I hope you're having a good day. We are staring at assembly and questioning our life choices. Okay, so we're not giving up control. It does that, it writes the line. And everything else should follow. This should fall through to J weight. Let's get rid of clear scratch pad for now because I don't think that's the problem. And so we get here, we're incrementing this here. Let's 
telephone right line here, right? No pretense. It's getting kind of hot. So there is like this like an additional problem here. I wonder if it's to do with the Executed. Isn't it storing issues by using non use register at each core and executed? Probably, yeah. I'm trying to, I'm, yeah. I think what we want to do is basically get to a point where we, we're ruling out every other possible issue. Um, so, like, let's comment out all of this code. We're just going to write I am heart. We're not going to bother printing out our heart ID right now. We know this works. Nick M, thank you for the follow. Hope you're having a lovely day. Uh, CSR, that should be fine. This should be fine. That should be fine. I'm going to change this to Word because I feel like that's probably better. Um, but as we've seen, we only get one printed. Is there a way we can be assured that but this is the minimum viable code here, right? If we get rid of this branch, then we know that We get four printed out. So we know that our printing is working. We know that um, our heart code checks are working. Uh, we know that if we kind of change this, anything from one to four, like if we made this three, um, like we know we're still going to get one out. And if we like put back in our right line here, we'll get heart three printing out. This and we go call right line yes I am hot yeah it's like that yeah it skips and we for some reason are not printing out the other thing but Yes, yeah, I'm not sure if we're actually storing the ink value into the correct. Okay, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We are going to put this back to zero, so we know it's hot zero, and we know we're going to set up UART correctly. And instead of doing anything else, we are going to call that. We are going to increment the hot lock value up front. We're then going to load that value back in to T0. Uh, so T1. And then we are going to print that out instead. So that will tell us if we're actually storing something correctly. Because if we are, then that value should be 1. It should be 1. Uh, so we do that, calling that, and we call right line, which is correct. Is there anything else that we need to do here? Uh, T1, T0. Okay. So this says I am heart empty. Um, is that because I'm still using right line for heart? Yeah. So this should be right UART. I just want to make that like a right. Uh, let's do. But yeah, it looks like we're not storing that value correctly. 
Oh no, I am hot one. There we go. So that is being written correctly. We know we're incrementing that value correctly. So we do the lock, we call right you up, we increment the hot lock, we load it in, we print that out. Um, and we jump. But for some reason, we are still locking for... My only guess is that it must be like caching that value or... Um, Because if we make this, if we now make this two, then yes. Hey, look at that! I am hot one. I am hot one. So two calls became activated. And we can make this three. W5 should only halt one core. Um, right, so now we're getting um, now we're getting two cores that are being activated uh, at the same time, which is confusing. Now we're back to I am hot zero. I make this one, and this should be I am hot one. I am hot one. Okay, so we know it's working if we, like if I comment that out, then now this should say I am hot too because it's printing out the oh okay did I not compile that properly or one the value of hot lock into T1, add that, and it says 1. <laughs> okay. So this loads the value of M hot ID, which should be 1 since it's the only one that can pass this chat. There's one. Oh my god. Add T1, T0, T1. Oh, that can't be it. I'll be so annoyed if that's it. Okay, well, that logic's working correctly now. But it's still not doing that. So Okay, so we now know that we're loading the value of T that, we're storing that into the value of Hatlock, we're reading it again, and we are loading that in. I'm wondering if this logic is just like Q 
he moon is just refusing to loop that many times and is like either cashing it out or over optimizing or like some other ridiculous thing you know um, We now know that that value should be correct. We're reading it in, we're writing it out, and we're doing it, and we're calling it. <sighs> so what we could do is just um, give it some useful work to do for a little bit and see if like that helps at all. Um, Cause I, otherwise I don't see what the problem is here. If I jump this back to it. That doesn't change anything. Um, not waiting. My fear is that this is just like this is an emulation issue, not a bug issue. Because we know that this read is correct. We know if we like if we ch if we change the hot lock value, it works. Could put a mem block there, just to kind of like. Okay, this is getting weird. We know that this works. We know that reading this value of hotlock is correct, at least for the first read. We know that this right works. We know that pretty much all of this works. What we don't know is if like we're failing to do something um, here. I wonder if we get rid of this, we just increment hotlock, like if we just do that. I am hot, I am hot, I am hot, I am hot. Okay, so the problem is that there is a bug here somewhere. We're doing something wrong in our Tasty code. We know it's probably not grabbing the hot ID, but we're gonna go through these one by one and like try to establish the actual failure case. So that's fine. Ally should be fine, adding should be fine, adding some scratch pad should be fine. <sighs> I know what the problem is. Okay, yeah, so I bet this, I bet this fails. Nope, really? Oh, because brain loading. I wonder if the scoring to the scratch pad fails. I wonder if we're clobbering scratch pads. I am hot. Yeah, okay. So we are clobbering scratch pads. Uh, 
pad so we shouldn't be clobbering scratch pads if we increment the hot lock afterwards I'm hot I'm hot I'm hot I'm hot okay so if we now do the call read line hot zero and it stops because there is something wrong with this. If I get rid of this, then that works okay. So the problem is that something is like this is causing some kind of loop that we do not want. So call right line. Call Frank you up for the first day zero. Do we use scratch pad before that point? Wait, I don't think so, right? I guess we do use right line. New line and call right line. And right line. we could make right you out a bit more robust but I don't think that's the problem uh, right you are yep so it's doing that it's doing that it's looking at t1 t2 um this will clobber T1, T2, and E0. Because if we... We know it's correct up until that point. But we also know that like if we try to write anything after this call then we will also not print out anything so we know it's this call that's wrong so if I comment this out we should at least get like two I am hards one following the other yeah four I am hards yeah so everything else works Fine, it's just this problem here. Okay, so what if we do store byte x0, 1, a0? Nope. Why is this causing a particular issue? Okay, let's make sure that we're not like freezing up on that. Let's double check the UART thing and let's do this as transmit empty. Let's read port five and, and check it. Um, do it here. So, no, uh, it's just going to jump to write UART. So, let's load into T1 uh, this plus five. Let's read the uh, value that is in there into T2. Branch, if uh, we need to end it, can I end it? Is that, yeah, I think that should be fine. Uh, can you not? It's all, I can sub. Right, 
pretty sure I can end. Um, so, low intermediate into T3, um, next 20, and T3, T2 with T3, put the value into T1, branch if not equal to 0, Branch equal to zero. T one ready up. Okay, so it's not that, and that seems to be okay. So Why is this called to right line failing? We're loading the value of our scratch pad into A0. We're storing the value of T1 and we know that's correct, it is being printed out. Um, and then we should be calling, but I'm gonna make this write you up instead. Wait, is there just a problem with the new line itself? Okay, I am hot zero, I am hot one, I am hot two, I am hot three, I am hot. I guess that's because I've got this I am hot the end. Yeah. Okay. Let's get rid of that. I'm hot zero, I'm hot one, I'm hot two, I'm hot three. So it's just a problem with our right new line function. Amazing. Um are we clobbering new line? <gasps> Are we clobbering new line? We all load no, because we are loading E0 and we're never like writing over that, right? Wait, if I write these values out again. We do that, we call write you out, and then we just write a new line here manually. I'm hot zero, I'm hot one, I'm hot two, I'm hot three. So why does calling that properly do that? Well, this is hilarious. Okay, so we know that everything is working except our new line function, which is not at all what I thought was broken. But now that we know that, we can go to our right line function and see that we do call right new art, we call new line call it and we return. Easy to obtain the address of the string to print. Right line will then... Where does uh, the return address get put in? It should be right in x1. It should, we should not be touching it at all. Like we don't clobber x1 at all in any of these. If I get rid of this from here, really, get rid of this from here. Oh, is oh my God, is this a 
Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the wonderful world of bootloader writing, where you don't set up a stack, and so you mangle your return address when you do a call within a call, and then it never comes back again. So, for now, we're going to do uh, 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 why do we copy a register? Move a not a zero, R zero. R A. Move R A. Move T. Let's, let's call this um, S zero into R A. Call that. And we move back. And that's fine. Um, then we can call again. And we're clobbering. Move this back. R A to S zero. Success. I am so sorry about spending an hour because we didn't save our return address. But that was what day zero is about. It's remembering all these little things that you forget. Okay. <laughs> So now we have a very, very, very basic bootloader that starts at four cores, configures UART, uh, parks those, parks three cores while it configures UART on heart zero, and then in order it starts up heart zero, heart one, heart two, and heart three in order, and they announce themselves. Ta-da! So now, just to kind of show off a little bit, let's go up and let's create eight cores. And let's just double check that everything works as expected. Look at that. Magic. Scalability. Very nice multiplexing. Everyone is sharing. It is great. That was a lot. I'm going to take a short break. If you have any um, questions, thoughts, comments, uh, ideas of what, what you would like to see next, let me know. Uh, I'll be back in five minutes with some new water, maybe some more coffee, and we will uh, continue.
there was more coffee, thankfully. So, hello everybody. Where was the bug? Uh, that's a great question. So we were clobbering uh, the return address value um, in, so by default, and kind of in here, uh, calling convention is that the return address for a call gets put into register X1 or RA. And in our um, right line function, uh, we were actually doing two calls, and because of that, we were clobbering the return address back to um, our announce function. So we were effectively just um, spiraling off into infinity. So to fix it, we just cache the return address into a save register, and we uh, pop it back into the um, we pop it back into RA and return, and everything works lovely. Ah, cool. That is probably worth um, stopping and just uh, configuring and uh, saving where we are. This is uh, each heart announces itself. OS means operating system. Yes, uh, today we're building a little bootloader, uh, just getting used to the conventions of the architecture that we're building the operating system for and kind of just mostly for me refreshing my assembly knowledge. So we now have a multi-core operating system. It doesn't do much. All it does is print out its name and each heart then announces itself in turn, each heart then giving up control to the heart that precedes it. Um, this is cooperative multitasking. Uh, it is a terrible way to organize an operating system if you at all are worried about adversarial programs um, taking hold of cores, but for now, it's a nice model and it will do us until we move on to something more complex. Ah, so what should we do next? I want to leave memory management and paging uh, probably tomorrow. Uh, we will get on to that. What is the name of the book on the screen? Uh, this is the RISC-V instruction set manual. Uh, this is volume two, privileged architecture, and we're also looking at volume one, which is the unprivileged architecture. Um, I will provide a link in chat to these books, because I don't think we've actually The nice thing about RISC-V is that all the specifications are online and they're free to use, so uh, there we go. Uh, let's throw this in here. Uh, you all also want to consult these RISC-V specifications, which are here. Awesome. And let me just update that. Sure, up to date there. Okay. So I think we should just um, use Kimu command. Uh, yes, we're gonna. Yeah, uh, all the. Uh, yeah, here it is. I don't 
here's what I'll do is I'll create a Okay, so yeah, let's um, it's using all of our newfound uh, capabilities to just print out some machine state, um, and then we will be able to um, tomorrow. We will come back to this and kind of start using that knowledge to uh, make things more complicated. Uh, so yeah, the hot status is probably a good place to start. Um, so the M status register is an MXLAN bit length read write register formatted as shown in figure 36 for RV32 and 37 for RV64, which is the one which is the architecture that we are working with. So this keeps track of keeps track of and controls the heart's current operating state. So when we want to switch down to supervisor mode um, and later on down to um, user mode, uh, we're going to need uh, various operations on the M status and the S status registers. And so it's important that we can read to them, understand those code, understand what state that we're in and are able to manipulate that. Cool, so we have a whole lot of information here. Um, let's see if we are defining these. All right, yeah, we've got these nice little wall fields. So we've got 64 bits containing um, interrupt statuses, um, mode statuses, and we'll take a look at what each of these are in turn as I remind myself how these work. So WPRI, what does that stand for? I love it when people introduce terminology. <laughs> okay, so we are looking for the definition of moral. Write any values, read legal values, right? Okay. Yeah, so we've got these uh, read, so we've got write legal values, read legal values, and we've got write any values, read legal values. And this just allows us to basically says that we can write any value to these registers, but we'll only be able to read legal values from it. So if a register can only have a legal value between like zero and four, if we write five to it, it will basically just ignore it. Um, or I think undefined behavior, or is it? Implementations will not raise an exception on rights of unsupported values to a wall field. Implementations can return any legal value on a read to a wall field when the last written value was illegal. So if we write junk to a wall, well, I hate wall, do we write any values, read legal values, uh, register, um, it can return anything back at us. So we're just going to stick with uh, legal values here and go back to the M status register. And WPRI is the other acronym that we want. WPRI stands for Reserved Rights, Preserved Values, Reads, Ignore Values. Uh, so some whole read-write fields are reserved for future use. Software should ignore the values read from these fields and should preserve the values held in these fields when writing other values. Cool, that makes sense. So what we've actually got here there's a whole bunch of reserved fields um, interspaced with the actual like information that we want. For understanding, you're building an OS, but first up to check instructions. Um, yeah, so we are, um, the goal is to uh, build out an operating system. Uh, the first day that we are doing this is to kind of get familiar with the architecture that we're building on, get familiar with the calling conventions, um, and we're just going to read a bunch of machine registers just to make sure that we've situated ourselves correctly 
because uh, later on we're going to want to start manipulating these registers to switch um, privilege modes uh, to turn on and turn off interrupts, uh, handle trap values, that kind of thing. Awesome, cool. So let's, um, do we have a list of what these are? Yeah, okay. Global interrupt bits, MIE and SIE, are provided for M mode and S mode, respectively. These bits are primarily used to guarantee atomicity with respect to interrupt handlers in the current privilege mode. When HOT is executing in privilege mode X, interrupts are globally enabled when XIE is equal to 1, and globally disabled when XIE is equal to 0. So we should be operating in privilege mode machine right now. So the uh, MIE bit here, which is the um, fourth bit along, bit three, uh, should be set to um, zero for interrupts to be turned off. Uh, interrupts for low privilege modes are globally disabled regardless of the setting. Um, yeah, so we don't need to worry about SIE or UIE in supervised machine mode. Um, and yeah, we have to care about everything above us, but there's nothing above us right now. Uh, to support nested traps, each privilege mode can respond to interrupts. There's two level stack of interrupt enabled bits in privilege modes. XPAE holds the value of the interrupt enabled bit active prior to the trap, and XPP holds the previous privilege mode. So this um, isn't relevant to us right now, but will be relevant to us when we start switching between privilege modes. I guess we might switch to um, supervisor mode today. Um, we'll see. MRAT or STRAT allow us to go between these. That's fine. Base size control. Uh, for 64 bit systems, the SXL and UXL fields are write all read legal fields that control the value of MXLEN for S mode and U mode. Um, the encoding of these fields is the same, effective XLN, X mean mode, term XLN, respectively, we don't care about that. If S mode is not supported, then XL is read only, um, otherwise it's a write only read only field. Uh, memory privilege bit modifies the effective privilege mode, the privilege level at which loads and stores execute. When MPRV is equal to zero, loads and stores behave as normal. Uh, when MPV one, um, then their addresses and protected and all that kind of stuff. So that's for memory handling. Um, I think tomorrow we'll probably get around to paging. Um, we'll see how we do. Um, that modifies the MXR bit. NDNS control. Virtualization support, which we don't care about. Execution context, which we might care about later on. And the machine trap factor, okay. So yeah, let's just do some sanity checking. And let's, uh, in our setup function, let's define a new um, Call uh, sanity check. Cool. And then this we're going to read the value of m status into t0. And the first thing that we are going to do is we are going to read the interrupt bit for machine mode. which is bit three. So let's do and uh, oh, uh, load intermediate T1 zero three. Uh, no, 
but wait, is that a bit long? That's uh, math eight zero. Not eight zero, just eight. One zero zero zero. Yeah. Uh, do you have any advice for starting cybersecurity and beginner who have background in programming? Um, my basic advice is just to kind of explore as much, as many areas as you can, especially if you're just getting started out. Um, whether it's like low level programming or like machine learning or um, kind of like website security, um, all of those different areas you're going to pick up different skills from and you'll be able to uh, link the stuff that you pick up and with each other. And yeah, the important thing is just to start doing stuff. If you're really interested in low level, uh, you know, manipulating stacks, buffer overflows and stuff, go uh, try out a couple of CTFs, go um, play around with some of the like binary exploitation um, uh, like exercises that are out there. Um, you want to get started in website security? Go, um, go start reading browser specs <laughs> and like HTML specs and definitely. So my um, my job prior to um, what I do now, uh, I used to work at. I used to work in, um, I was a security engineer for um, Amazon and my job there was to, um, right at the end, was to look at, uh, look at ways that um, vendors could exploit, um, exploit uh, AI, uh, like kind of computer generated prices or try to exploit Amazon's automatic ordering processes, um, try and find ways to secure that. Um, and like a lot of that fed into like AI systems, um, kind of machine learning algorithms. Uh, we had like good fun trying to work out all, all the different ways and all the different um, restrictions that we had. Um, there's also a bunch of like, you know, AI and security getting blended in weird ways. People are trying to use AI to detect malicious traffic, however useful that skill is. Um, so you're always gonna find um, like niches for AI in every field and like cybersecurity is no different. Actually, that's a good point, wanna be smoky, that like a lot of the like um, classical binary exploitation challenges now, if you try to compile them with like a modern compiler, they will just not let you overwrite buffers. Like they will happily, um, crash safely um, so you you do have to put some time and effort into configuring them um, properly uh, and you're welcome so we were trying to read the m status bit and if my binary math is correct we should just be ending it with this so t0 t1 and we'll just store this in T1 for now. And so we're going to uh, have a rat here, have a label that's a sanity check dropout. Actually, I wonder if we can just skip an instruction. Yeah, I'll do this for now. Branch if not equal to zero. Yep. Um, is that correct? Yeah, we might have to do that. <laughs> um, I haven't called anything yet, but why not? Um, uh, 
Oh uh, no, because we don't want to clap it twice. Oh god, okay. Do we just need to create our returns back now? Just before we get too annoyed with everything. Probably. I don't want to set the stack. Yeah, have stack pointers. Do we have same instructions for stack operations in this curve? Eh, you know what? For now. Um, yeah, okay, let's do that. Stacks are copy tried from instructions that shows for calling accurate instruction copy of the system. It's the instructions to carry implicitly via the register as used. We have a stack pointer. We can compare it. So let's load the address of T1 stacks. Actually, we can probably load this straight into SP. out by getting rid of this and seeing if uh, we no longer clobber this. Oh. 
else needs to get this calling function correct? Or do we, or are we just gonna have to implement this properly? Let me remind myself. Yeah, okay, we're just gonna have to suck it up for now. And then later on, we will jump to a sane compiler that will do this for us. Um, close on chat, it's gonna load this up, we're gonna do some stuff. We are going to store, let's say, register. Somewhere safe. Now that's somewhere safe for now. This one. Uh, yep. And so branch not equal to zero here. So here we should just be able to print out. Um, change this back to four. Um, okay, so we're going to load, we're going to store S1 just so we can get back. We are going to load M status into T0. We're going to load eight into uh, T1 and we're going to end T0, T1 and put the result in T1. Then we branch if not equal to zero. Here, the skipping out of machine mode check. Um, so let's go back here and understand what MIE should be. Uh, also, let's think about Indianus for a second. Also, we're checking the interfits, intra not um, mode. Uh, we want we want the privilege bit, not the MIE bit. Okay, we know the interrupts are disabled though. So that's a good start. Um, MPP. So MIE, which are the interrupt bits, we've got two levels back of MPP. We've got MRATS. Where is the mode? Is that, oh, is, it in, is there an M mode? Am I misremembering uh, machine level CSRs got the ISA we know we're in 64 bit 
Uh, we'll check the time a little bit. Uh, we'll check these later on. Render ID is pointless. And auth ID. That's the micro architecture. Season 30 is the proper process implementation. Hard ID and status. Yeah, so we've got a whole bunch of information. Let's trap each privilege mode, can respond to interrupts, right, oh, yeah, I'm perfect. Fit 17. Well, that's just memory protection, right? MP or the yeah, modify privilege, the effective privilege mode. It proves out which stores execute. And then PMV, yeah, so that's not that. How do we know that we are not in supervised mode? I guess we know we're in machine mode because we can access machine registers. But is there actually a way of confirming that at the register level? I seem to remember that there was, but I might be wrong. We've got interrupts. We've got uh, like interrupt stack handles, basically, to tell us what we will. We've got the memory privilege bits. We've got the executable bits. And we've got MD. And those are the end unisic memory accesses. Let's just go through this and make sense of it. Uh, the MSS register is 64 bits long and it's got a whole bunch of interesting information. A bunch of bits only exist in the 64 bit version. Um, right. So we've got the interrupt bits that basically talk, tell us whether interrupts are enabled or not. Um, interrupts for lower privilege modes are always going to be disabled regardless of the setting, um, which makes sense. Uh, MRI ISR instructions are used to return to trap mode respectively when executing a run instruction. Supposing XPB holds the value of Y, XIE is set to X, P, and E. The privilege mode is changed to Y. So it's set to 1. Oh, yeah, so that just allows us to go up the um, privilege stack. I wonder if I need to be reading. I 
using these uh, right okay Anytime a hardware thread is running at some privilege level encoded as a mode in one of or more CSRs, three of those privileges are currently defined. So where are these privileges accessed from? Or rather, how can I work that out? So we've got uh, floating point stuff, unprivileged cameras, um, we've got the supervisor information, and we've got the hypervisor information that we've got, we've got, so we've got vendor ID, architecture ID, information ID, uh, we've got the configuration data structure, um, M scratch. I say what if we can... I guess we can just assume, like, we can access a register, it would complain if we wouldn't. Um, but if it's encoded, you would think it would be encoded. Privilege, privilege. When the heart is executing privilege point X, yeah, we know that. Privilege modes can separate print by hyperprivilege, mode, privilege, privilege, nested traps, low privilege modes. software can determine whether a privilege mode is implemented by writing that mode to MPP and reading it back. If the machine provides only U and M modes, then only a single hardware storage bit is required to represent either 0 or 1-1 one one in MPP. Okay, MPP. machine previous for okay those are virtualization things and we've got machine status register so we've got MPP here which is bit 12 and those are hypervisor stuff so let's get up back to um right okay Right. To support nested traps, each privilege mode can respond to interrupts has two levels of stack of interrupt enable bits in privilege modes. XPIE holds the value of the interrupt enable bit acted prior to the trap. XPP holds the previous privilege mode. The XPP fields can only hold privilege modes up to X. So MPP is two bits wide and SPP is one bit wide. When a trap is taken from privilege mode Y into privilege mode X, XPI is set to value. Okay, so we can read privilege mode. Uh, we can read um, MPP, which is... bits 11 and bits 12. So 
if we uh, bit seven, bit twelve, that is uh, three zero uh, eight. Three seven twelve uh, eight. B one one zero 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 Nope. So yes. Um double check the encoding of MPP, which is up here. So machine code should be one one here. So um, so if these are equal to zero. Actually, we just need like one bit here, but yeah. So if we just check the machine mode bit, mode machine, awesome. Um, and we obviously break because I have not taken into account some things here. Uh, let's do right line. Go back to S1. Oh, let's move our A into S1. Move S1 into R. C00. Zero, zero. Yes, that is. Uh, let's go to that, compile. Cool! We now have the red machine and that's working good. So yeah, if we now, we know that the machine mode bit is set. Um, now we actually need to do a better check here. So we actually need um, the end T1 equals that T2. And then we're going to do branch, uh, branch, branch equal, branch equal, yeah. Let me, right here, branch equal, uh, T, T1, T2. Just to confirm that we are in machine mode. Awesome. Right. Cool. That is looking good. be good here is if we just kind of uh, do the same thing again. Check that, check that, and that, that. If I jump to sandwich to check end. So we're branching to sand to check end here. So and check supervisor. Supervisor mode should be uh, zero one. 
here, which is four. No, we can read that register. Um, probably check a couple of other things uh, while we are here. Um, and yeah, we'll do that. So sanity check interrupts. That is not how you spell interrupts. And that was bit. Was the interrupt bit. And so we can go to bum 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 bum. Check this to uh, four. Um, yep, and that was that. Nope, this is eight. Um, so I click end. And then, oh. and drop this on. Actually, that's probably what we want to do is just um, have a standard function for this. Go to load that right. What? Look at that, and those together. Um, put that in. Uh, shift this down. Uh, left shift. Do we need, I think we probably, um, Yeah, let's 
Okay, instructions set listing. Yeah. Shift left. Left setter. This one's bad. Two, two, three, two, one, and rest. Illegal offerings. Okay. Um, Good right. Intermediate. Assignment is copied and duplicated upper bits. Oh, we need an output, I guess. Okay, um, so yes, machine interrupts blank, and we're putting it hot, so we're not breaking anything. We work out why this is not working. So we read the value of, we load the 8 into ti, we end p0, t1, and t2 together. I guess we also just shift it down. Um, that goes into t2. We load the interrupt data sync A0 and just write that out. We load 30 into T3. We shift T2 by oh by three bits. Um so that still shouldn't be the problem. We add T2 to T3 and throw the output into T1 and then we drop that there. What could be the problem? Maybe interrupt's not well terminated. So we're right now we're only ever using the first byte of Scratchpad. Um, and we know that it's writing like something out, because uh oh, 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 oh. You know, because it should be one or zero, right? So we're getting eight. Ending T0 to T oh wait, are we overriding T0 in this magical universe? Nope. Right, yes, we are. Okay, so let's first. Not clobber our registers. Still not the one. So load T0 into that, load that into that, do that. Because we can just check this. Because um, we can say something like, you know, if interrupts are disabled, you know, if branch equal to zero, um, T1, then 
go to Sims Check End. So we know that like interrupt status is zero um, because we skip over it when we do this check. So we move this check, then we're going to call our IT lot for the interrupt status. We are going to shift this by three. I guess what we could do is we could just end this. Um, by one. Look at like, if we just ignore this for now, then we should just get an, like a slightly higher number and we can correct it as we go. Um, nope. Okay. Third immediate, T0, zero, 0, not T1, so they just print 0. Assuming that everything else about our code is correct, which it clearly isn't. Um, well, it's not failing. Oh wait, call uh, Zerx Birdie here. Okay, and that's clobbering something. Why is that clobbering something? This should just load zero on into T1. This should load that into A0. That should be fine. And we should be saving that register okay for now. So like, yeah, if we get rid of this, then. Oh, interesting. Branch, decent build sense interrupts. Okay. And we're going to load M status again. We're going to look into these. Um, that looks fine. into T3. We're going to shift T2 by shift T right by three bits. We're going to add T2 to T3, put the answer into T1. But for now, we can just ignore all of these and just put 30 straight into T1. 
a load easier on some scratch pads. Yeah, it's just doing nothing for now. That works out fine. Going to store T0 into A0. This breaks it. Why does this break it? A0 should be safe as a register. Should not be clobbering. A0 is all the way down here. Our tenant address is. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> okay. Um. Wow, we really need that call stack. if there are semantics for this. If there are not, we'll just implement them. But if I do push RA, Crossbow, nope. thank you for the follow. Hope you're doing okay. So store RA into the address. Don't play our stack pointer. Load the immediate into T0. One. Add um, T0 T1 rally into SP and then pop. We're going to do the reverse. We're going to um, mode. It's R A. We're going to Does this let this work. Let's check. Uh, let's just uh, console a standard check for now, and let's do. Um, Nope, that, no, 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 we need macros. Uh, okay, what is the macro language here? Um, okay, is this just kind of like... the state. Uh, 
Gun store instructions use stack pointers to base stress registers since they're so common. This is gonna be really a stores so a 64 bit value in this due to memory, it computes the effect address by adding zero set of scale by eight stack pointer, expands this D. Thank you, it's my C. Expands the C to S2 and offsets. Save the first card and kind of exit. State code, stack point based compression load stores in RC are effective at reducing the save store sit code to factor 2 while improving performance. Common mechanism used in other methods is to load store multiple instructions. Um, Right, so these are part of the compression um, opcodes. All the sixty by the light. There's no dedicated stack pointer or subroutine return address link register in the base integer ISO. The instruction encoding allows any X register to be used for these purposes. However, the sense of a calling convention uses X1 to hold the return address of a call with register X5 available as the alternative link register. The standard call convention uses register X2 as stack pointer. How do I might choose to accelerate function call and returns? It uses X1 and X2. The optional 16 bit instruction format designed around the assumption that X1 is the return address register and X2 is the stack pointer. Software using other conventions will operate correctly, but may be greater size. Number of available architectural registers can have an impact on the code size. Yep. And then, yeah, and then we're into the compression threads. There's no immediate way of doing this. Um, Guess we can create a macro to just do this for us. Um, <sighs> what am I thinking of here? Let's try. version do we need to be in for this? Uh, do we need, um, nope. Was there a dot macro? Are we in a different? It's been a very, very long time since I've done this. 
I primed the list for a macro push, right? Yep. Boom. Okay, cool. So now that we've got that, we can change our right line thing here to push and pop. Okay, uh, let's look at what's wrong with that. Um, so, load RA. Into the snack pointer. Oh, are we growing up? Um, Dress that's pointed to by the stack pointer, which oh, because we haven't set up stacks for anything else, of course. Um, Oh, we've got the high view already. Um, so yeah, mile t0, by t1, and put the result into uh, sp. This will be t. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so we want to load. Okay, load in t0, load that into t2, and then we need. Um, so times t0 by t2, put the result into t3, add the result to t1, and put it into the stack pointer. Except stacks, stacks points here, it's a colon 92. Um, we load the address of stacks into T1. We load 1024 into T2. We multiply the hot ID by 1024 and put the result into T3, giving us either 0, 1024, uh, 2048, or 4,096. Nope, 3,000. Oh god, come on, Sarah. 1024, 1048, or 3,000 and. How long has this thing been? Four hours. Yeah. Mike is really low compared to other streamers. I will fix that. Bump up the volume a little bit. Is that better? 72. Is that an answer to my math question or something else? Um, okay. Let's 
So we have 1,024. We want to give each heart 1,024 um, bytes of stack space, words of stack space. Um, we're going to multiply that by that. We're going to multiply the hot ID by, um, by 1,024, which will give us the result. We're going to put that in T3. We're going to add T3 to the stack frame to get that, and we're going to put the result into the stack pointer. And then we're going to go from there. Uh, I'm surprised that, like, why does this clobber, am I getting my things confused again? Oh no. That would also explain something. Okay, so there's at least a couple of maths that we need here. So let's put that stack pointer. Uh, let's put that to T1. Okay. Yes, okay. So we now know that our push and pop macros work, which now means that we can add a push here, and we can add a pop here, no longer having to worry about that. That's beautiful. Okay, so let's make this math correct. And now we're going to go to here, 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 and that breaks now, which is all kinds of exciting. Um, I have a feeling that we are also mm -hmm. screwing up somewhere else. We we're very lucky because these are symmetric. Is this now? No, because they shouldn't grow up, right? Because we're not, we're setting them to zero, so they should just grow into their values. So if that's now just doing that. Um, which could just mean that we're just getting stuck on. Okay, let's drop our sanity check for now. So we're back to this particular problem where we're printing this out, probably because we, let's go to where we're incrementing uh, this magic. Loading them hot zero, uh, loading that into that T1, T2, T0, storing, that looks fine. Um, so why did this work one way around and not the other way around? Uh, probably because SP didn't change before. Okay, let's double, 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 double check.
Yeah, sauce mm -hmm. destination. Okay. So. T0. So we're going to load. So we're going to load stack pointer into, all right, into stack pointer. So that is correct. Four fifteen. Both. Yeah. We're gonna load one into T zero. Why is T one here? That okay. Add one to stack pointer. Okay. Okay. What's wrong with this? We know that one is printing out, okay. Um why are the others not printing out okay? Chain prints out okay, and it's not. So yeah, it's something wrong with our um, right line function. So right line, we push. Oh, um, that can go away. Still a problem. What platform are we talking? We're targeting Risk Five. So yeah, okay, so let's go back to this, let's cancel that out, and let's go back to our macro, and just confirm what we're doing here. So we are storing the return address onto the stack, and then we're adding one to the stack pointer. Might have to add more than one to the stack pointer. Um, So glad I did a pre-day. Um, I don't know what language we will jump to. Um, the last time I went through this exercise, I did it in Rust. It's been a few decades since I used C in anger. Um, so both could be fun. Uh, are there any uh, opinions on what language you would like to see this written in? Once uh, we finished hitting our head against the wall with <laughs> Risk Five assembly. Rest. Cool. Okay. What is weird here? So it's like if we get rid of these, right? So the problem is that we're not putting things back where we found them, because like this should not affect anything at all. All good. So the problem is this particular um, 
um, set up here. Oh. Yeah. This is exactly the wrong way around, isn't it? Yay! We have a functioning stack. So, now that we have that, let's turn Sanity checking back on. Uh, Sand check pushes at the start, goes through it, writes machine mode out. It's going to do some other stuff here. Um, make sure that we're printing this out correctly. We're going to interrupt some then failing. Why are we failing at interrupts? Ah, the process right UART isn't. Um, yeah, let's see, push here and do a pop here. Job. Um, double check that that is correct elsewhere. Okay, we're back at weirdness, which means that something else is wrong. Oh, because right you are. Okay, yeah. Um, back endlessly. Um, oh, where you are. Oops, where you are. End. Nope, where you are. Loop is correct. Um, oops. Assembly. Rid of these. That looks fine. But they should work without it. Um, push. Push here. We're going to go through here. Everything should be fine. Loop. We're gonna go back to this loop. This is gonna jump to the end. At the end, we wanna pop the call stack. But if we do that, we freeze. Because right line is push, call you out. Needs will do push pop. You out will do push pop. And then we pop. Uh, is this now a case where we actually do not want to be clobbering? We need to care about. Yes. Okay. Cool. Make sure we're moving the stack address the right size. Now we'll get a sanity check. Uh, sanity check should now just work. We get the interrupts again. Um, interrupts, it calls right you out. Um, OK, 
okay. So we've still got the problem whereby something is wrong with this logic. So we can load 30 into TI. Oh, because we need to actually load that on the scratch pad, don't we? Oops. Yep. Interrupt zero. We are finally getting somewhere. Uh, problem is it doesn't fall back down. Um, so, why is that? Okay, so we have the status register. We are doing that. Um, we are at interrupts. That's great. We call you at start. Everything is amazing. We want to load 30 to T3. We want to shift T2 by 3. We want to add the result back into T1 by adding T2 to T3. We load scratch pad into A0. We store T1 into our scratch pad and we call right line. some reason we write in trip zero, we write light line, and then we freeze. Even though we should pop and return. My only assumption is that perhaps our stack isn't like this eight is oh I know this is probably not the right number, but... Nope, okay. That's weird. Okay, so we... The problem seems to be... If I comment out this... We still get stuck. Okay. So at what point do we not get stuck here? Okay, cool. So the problem is this SB uh, T0 scratch pad. Why does writing T1 to the scratch pad cause us to freeze? So I can comment that out. And that works fine. Like interrupts gets printed, everything else is great. is that this could be like, I can write interrupt status here, right? And everything else, like just to confirm that it's, yeah, I can write interrupt interrupts and everything else just continues. So why does storing this cause it to fail? So we do the same thing down here. Um, we store it in the scratch pad. I guess. Oh. No. No. So if you aren't right line. T1 
Strange name. Thank you for the follow. I hope you're having a good day. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Gabes, TK16. Thank you for the follow. I do hope that you're also having a good day. Okay, what if we load I T0 T1 1? Is it something about the value in T1 or is it just something with our scratch pad management that's a little weird? It's something about our scratch pad management. Okay. Um, so yeah, if we make this 0x30, as it probably should be. Zero. Fine. Uh, oh, because it's no longer a uh, scratch pad. Oops. Um, we're going to pull up our scratch pads. We're going to go to here. And we fail. So yeah, it's, it's nothing to do with that. It's something to do with the scratch pad itself. Um, Thing to do with Scratchpad itself. Store the address of Scratchpad into A0. Guess we could just use our uh, stack thing now instead of Scratchpad. And then store T1 into A0. And we're just throwing a byte. Then we call the right line. And we know right line succeeds because we get to this point. Presumably, I wonder if we can do anything after that. Like, if we, like, if I try to, like, do machine mode, like, here, for example. Okay, so we can do that. So it's something else that's weird. Some other thing that we're not assuming. So we're going to pop, we're going to return, and we're going to jump up to, um... We're going to come up to here, and we're going to announce. And then what's going to happen is, in announce, we're going to look at hot lock, and some stuff. We never get to the I am hot. Um, Something about 
No, because I, I did this, right? And that was fine. So, are we like overriding? should be big enough. Eight. <laughs> okay. Uh, cool. So the problem is that we are overriding Harlock. <laughs> uh, so let's get eight here. Awesome. I think that is all the new functionality that we're going to add today. And I think this is a cool down. I'm just going to go through, summarize what we've done today, set ourselves up for tomorrow, add some comments so that people can follow this along at home if they would like. Um, if there are any questions, any uh, thoughts, just let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to go through and just tidy things up. So. Here's our terminal can be small. Yeah, let's just move this down for now. What's the scope of this project? Any goals? Um, no goals thus far. I did a small um, I did a small survey on Mastodon uh, yesterday uh, to see what people kind of wanted to see on stream. And kind of the uh, opinions were split between um, kind of operating system development and some general fuzzing stuff. But yeah, yes, they were doing some Super Mario fuzzing. Uh, so the goal for the OS stuff, I asked what people wanted to see. And it was kind of a 30-70 split between 30% wanting to see some low-level classical OS dev memory management uh, process scheduling, that kind of stuff, and 70% wanting to really dive into uh, like graphics drivers, uh, networking stacks, that kind of thing. Uh, so I think the plan for this is to probably spend the next stream on OS Dev uh, setting up some memory protection, paging, uh, kind of getting our OS into a mode where it's more like an OS. Um, and then, because it was so popular, maybe writing a uh, graphics driver. Probably start with something like a very basic VGA, getting the picture up. And then we can kind of go from there, depending on what people want to see. Um, if we want to explore networking stacks, we can do that. If we want to explore um, windowing systems and creating frame buffers and getting Doom to run, uh, we can do that. Um, yeah, also, you know, happy to listen to feedback, ideas, um, let me know. Uh, so yeah, here's our data section, which for now contains a whole, contains, um, some useful strings for outputting Move these away for now. Um, we're putting our LS space. Uh, 
use a cooperative cooperative scheduling for our for our hots. Um, for now, we uh, serialize them through this heart lock. Later, we will only use this for access to shed resources. And some small memory um, that we can use as a scratch pad for useful temp values, etc. Allocate some stack space. Our final stats here. Make all hearts wait, except heart. Uh, so yeah, let's move this down here. Set up stack for heart 0 to 4, make all hearts except 0 weight, set up UART and print welcome, um, need some machine mode registers, and check that they are um, the values we expect. Show off that we can announce ourselves. And save some space the macro to push the return address to the local stack and to pop it off the game. Uh, a function to check M status. I'm not going to repo yet. I'm going to do it right at the end of the stream and I'll check it in the chat. Uh, a function to check M status uh, to check the um, MPP and MIE. Yeah. Um, line is a uh, function that will print out um, thing followed by the line. A zero should contain the address of the string to print, and right line will then write the string zero yot up. You up. Uh, set up you at um, ensure that you at is in you at is in a good state accepting the bit values. Writing string to UART. A0 should contain a pointer to the string we want to print. Let's put a little note here. Check that nothing is trying. Check that UART is free. Loop until null terminated. Um, no null. <sighs> and that's um, 
test function to ensure that parts can coexist, each heart will announce itself in turn and then give control to the next part. Eventually, use this to configure any heart specific structures. Um yeah. I'm just, uh put all core, put all hearts. Um, wait for Never come because they are turned on. Awesome. Okay, let's do this. Get add all, get commit. Okay, commented our initial bootloader. Ready for. Let's just go and create a repo for this. Arjun name. Make sure that exists. Awesome. And so move these things back. And so the first blob of code is now in this repo. Uh, if you want to play along, check it, play around with some things. Um, if there's anything not clear in the instructions or, um, you know, you think that something should be added, let me know. Uh, yeah. Uh, we've been going for five hours, so I am now going to sign off for the day. Uh, I'm planning to do another stream tomorrow as a follow-up and we will look at um, kind of memory management, layouts, probably get paging to work, drop into supervisor mode and kind of get ourselves ready for the next step. Uh, but this has been fun. Thank you all so much for watching. Uh, be sure to follow um, if you like more content and I will uh, talk to you soon.